Hello, and welcome to the Morristown Unitarian Universalist Fellowship. My name is Tish Hamilton, and I have the distinct privilege of serving as the chair of the Worship Arts Committee. We are a multi-generational, spiritually alive, radically inclusive, and justice-centered community, and we are so glad you are here with us today. To join us, to celebrate the power of words in honor of National Poetry Month. If you happen to be here during our 9 a.m. Facebook Live premiere or our 11 a.m. YouTube premiere, I invite you to say hello in the chat function so we can welcome you in real time. Following each service, there will be a virtual coffee hour on Zoom at 10 a.m. and again at noon. Today at 12.15 on Zoom, we will be hosting a prep rally for the upcoming Spring Fling service auction. As always, if you'd like to know more about our programming, you can visit us at our website at www.muuf.org. Again, I'm so glad you're here today. Thank you. Tis a strange mystery, the power of words. 
life is in them, and death. A word can send the crimson color hurrying to the cheek, hurrying with many meanings, or can turn the current cold and deadly to the heart. Anger and fear are in them. Grief and joy are on their sound, yet slight, impalpable. A word is but a breath of passing air. We are on a journey. We're traveling to fullness. We're building on the pathways of those who came before us. We are called to justice, freedom, equality, truth, compassion. Directed and paths were not completed, new roads must be erected, old obstacles defeated. We are called to justice, freedom, equality. The snow had melted, the buttercups were blooming, and Sylvia celebrated winter's end by writing a poem about spring. She walked with Shell to the park at the top of the hill and read it to a squirrel. Spring is here at last, I hope it doesn't end too fast. Like a bee, I'll sniff each flower, and I'll enjoy each springy hour. The squirrels seem grateful. Sylvia tied her poem to a birch tree and headed home, hoping that it didn't count as littering if it made the world more splendid. The next morning, Sylvia passed the birch on her way to school. From a distance, she saw her poem fluttering in the breeze, but when she got closer, she realized that it wasn't her poem at all. I think spring is the best of seasons for plenty of excellent reasons, like Birdie parents building nests where all the baby birds can rest. Sylvia's heart did a somersault. She never imagined the tree might write back. In class, Sylvia daydreamed about her new leafy friend. Sylvia, please pay attention, said Miss Oliver. Yes, yeah, Sylvia, whispered Walt, the boy sitting ne behind her. Their classmates giggled and Sylvia sank in her seat. After lunch, Miss Oliver taught the class about haiku. 
Sylvia struggled to contain her excitement in seventeen syllables. White birch on the hill speaks out loud through rustling leaves. Great green poetry. Miss Oliver gave Sylvia a gold star. When the bell rang, Sylvia ran straight to the poetry. She folded her haiku into a paper boat and pushed it halfway into a knot hole. So what's your name? Sylvia asked the tree, but the tree stood in silence. Are you shy like me? The tree nodded in the breeze. Sylvia understood. That night, Sylvia dreamed of rhymes falling like autumn leaves. She dreamed of cheerful songbirds greeting her in perfect rhyme. On Saturday morning, Sylvia rushed to the park with a heart full of hope. The knot hole was empty, and she saw no note on the branches. But the whisper of the wind in the leaves above her was like a poem. Sylvia looked up and saw fragments of sky peeking through the tree tops. She spoke the words as they blossomed into her mind. Sky so blue, grass so green, tree so tall in between. Favorite friend in morning light, and under moon glow late at night. Sylvia selected a twig from the ground. And gripped it like a pencil. Bye, Sylvia. She wrote in the air, but that didn't seem right. Love, Sylvia. She waved her stick with the flourish, accidentally hitting a branch. A tightly folded ninja star fell to her feet. Sylvia couldn't unfold it fast enough. I've wandered a while. Can a tree and a child be friends? Your words give me hope. Sylvia felt a spark in her heart. Good thing she brought sidewalk chalk. She scrawled in big blocky letters so the birch could see. I never thought that I would see such lovely poems from a tree. I wish that I could climb and live. Among the words you love to give, but if I lived up in a tree, I sure would miss my family. Sylvia thought it was the greatest thing she had written in all her years. She wrapped her, her arm around the poetry. It was stronger, wiser, and kinder than the children at school. She knew she would always have a friend at the park. She didn't open her eyes until Shell barked. Walt was there, staring at the ninja star haiku sticking out of Sylvia's pocket. That's not for you. That's for my tree. Sylvia blinked. It was from the tree, just for me. Walt shook his head. Sylvia didn't understand. Had the tree she loved so much not given her the thing? Sylvia didn't want to cry, not at the park. Walt didn't want her to cry either. I'm sorry I was mean at school, he said. Sylvia smiled. A friend of the tree is okay with me. She can never resist a good rhyme. Walt read Sylvia's chalk poem out loud. "You're a wonderful, wonderful poet," he said. "You deserve the gold star." But who is Shell? Sylvia pointed. "My best friend's name is Shell. I think he likes the way you smell." I can tell," added Walt. The two poets giggled. "Can I borrow your chalk?" Walt composed a new poem next to Sylvia's. If you want to share a poem with me, give it to the tall birch tree. Or if you need a friend for writing, playing with or sit beside,ing I'll be here for you joyfully. 
right beneath the poetry. The new friend sat a while, side by side, backs against the birch. Sunlight and shadows danced through the leaves above them as they silently searched for the most marvelous words to describe it all. Hi, my name is Janine Torsiello, and I've been a member of Muff for about 25 years. Many of you may know that I've been writing poetry since I was about eight years old. It seems most often I find inspiration comes in difficult times. A pandemic is definitely a difficult time. So at the very beginning of this pandemic, in March of 2020, I had been to a gathering with my Garden State Threshold choir members when one of our members got COVID, and we were all concerned because we had been exposed to her without her knowing she had it. Luckily, we didn't get it, but it certainly got our attention. I had a few friends who tested positive for COVID in other areas of my life, too. This was also the last time I was able to visit 100-year-old Sunny Riley, for whom I was caring at her nursing facility. It was three weeks before she died of COVID-related illness. It was a very hard time indeed. It was still very early on when we first started quarantining and went into what we thought would be a very short period of lockdown. Boy, were we wrong. It all started me thinking about how I address things like this and how important poetry is to my life. Out of that thought process came new poems, two of which I am sharing today to show how poetry springs from difficult times like these. These were written in the middle of March 2020 as lockdowns were new to us. The first poem is called Inner Introvert and came as a surprise to me, showing me a hidden side of myself illuminated by the pandemic. I was adjusting to Zoom meetings and isolation and finding that the usually gregarious me was having a harder time with the meetings than with the isolation, which I found interesting. The second poem is called Daring Enough to Listen. It incorporates some of my poetry influences and a little bit about the power of poetry. Poetry can lift us up, heal us, inspire us, and bring us new understandings. It is spiritual, funny, enlightening, comforting, and joyous. Poetry comes when we need it and changes our mood, our hearts, our spirits, and brings us peace, love, and understanding humor, grace, and a way to grieve, a window into our own soul, or that of someone we know and love, as well as those we don't, and into the soul of the poet, too. Poetry is powerful, compact, supercharged language that can do the things superheroes can do. It is faster than a speeding bullet, more powerful than a locomotive, and able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. In short, poetry has always been my superpower, and with it I believe I can do anything, even if it is only on the page and in the air around my voice as I speak my truth in poetry. So here are some pandemic poems. The first is Inner Introvert. At times like these, I find there is an inner introvert lurking deep inside, a stranger to most friends and a friend in times like these. Most people I know don't know this part of me. Sometimes I don't even know this part of myself. But, I, but then I remember once upon my time, a long, long time ago, I knew this person inside of me. We spoke out loud, tripped poetry off our tongue, answered each other's questions into the air around us, got wisdom sometimes, cried sometimes, sometimes even laughed all alone in rooms I no longer have permission to roam except inside my mind. It is strange sometimes these days to reacquaint with this inner introvert, especially now when things are mostly out of my own control. I feel a familiarity and yet a strangeness too. But now I have the time to rediscover who this quiet, lone voice is and has become. 
Forced though this is, it is an opportunity to be another part of who I always was again. The second poem <clears throat> is called Daring Enough to Listen. If only I could write like Mary Oliver, write something special and inspiring about the outdoors or the wild life we live. If only I could call for all to rise up and be phenomenal like Maya Angelou. If only my humor was sharp but subtle as that of Billy Collins, I could make you laugh at you and me and the dog too. If I could whirl the words out like the dervish poets Rumi or Hafiz, words of wisdom and love, longing and desire, poetic musings of romance from Shakespeare to Song of Solomon, if only I could lift the words off the page, place them on your tongue, fling them around the room, bounce them off the walls of tenements and penthouses, churches and sidewalks, chalkboards and library shelves, into and out of your ears and down into your heart. If only I could chase the blues through the trumpet and out into the halls of the St. James Infirmary, leaving behind something to be remembered by anyone daring enough to listen. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Don Lynch, and I'll be reading um, a few of my poems this morning. Uh, I'm going to start with one that was inspired by a choir member who suddenly and unexpectedly passed away. I was new to the choir, and, and I didn't know her, but I did know that she was much loved uh, by the choir members, and she had a lovely voice. Uh, so that was the inspiration for this poem uh, that is of her and for her. Sunrise of Recall. A life ended before embraced by those who knew her well, who mourned her voice and the silent space where she once stood. Her voice delicate, beautiful, aloft as the cavalier holds high the ballerina for all to see, all to hear, all to love in the sunrise of recall. The next poem is a bit irreverent, okay? Um, for many, many years I've uh, competed in a national uh, poetry contest, which is the National Allen Ginsberg Contest. And every year the finalists from all over gather in Patterson um, at the Poetry Center, which is part of the Hamilton Club, uh, which is uh, a um, replica of the Medici Palace in Florence, incidentally. It's quite a building. And in the Great Hall, they gather. And it's standing room only. The place is packed with poets. So as I said, this is somewhat my irreverent impression of that event. And it's called Poets Gather on a Fall Afternoon. A deep breath. Many words have been said this afternoon, landing like leaves on my ear. Year after year, they pile on top of one another to be covered by the first snowstorm or blown and tracked indoors with all the other words that fill the poetry books on my kitchen table. Haven't we heard enough this November day? Is it a time to step outside, to be up and doing, mending fences or stacking firewood? Shouldn't we sound a trumpet and praise the Lord? or invite him in for a good cup of coffee and a piece of pie? Must we endure more words that bend our brains to the breaking point as each new word elbows into the crowd of hidden meaning that jars us awake days later? Is it a time to revolt? Is it a time to say enough is enough? Is it a time to just hum? <laughs> 
So that's it. Oh, it's scattered. You got to get the idea. Words are flying all over the place. Okay. All right. So here's what's going on now with me. Uh, Allison and my wife, for all our time together, have loved the outdoors. And we have hiked, skied, snowshoed, backpacks in the mountains of New Hampshire, uh, the Adirondacks, in Utah, and in Colorado. And a little aside, when I proposed to her, she said, well, what makes you think it's going to work, Don? And I said, because we've never had a bad hike. We've always had fun. Okay. So she thought about it. And she accepted. So here I am. Okay. So this is this poem is, is for is for Allison, my dear Allison. It's a rhyming poem, which I don't often write. So I'll we'll see how it works. The title is When I Think of Drifting Snow. When I think of drifting snow and the swirl of years where memories go. I dream again of long ago of nooks and crannies where memories grow, on mountaintops where lovers know of the softest swirl of drifting snow, the sound of wind where the balsams grow, as though to whisper, whisper, I love you so. And I do. <laughs> okay. All right, audience. Uh, this next poem is, is a rather short poem. It did quite well in a contest, and we'll see how it does today. Uh, I, I wrote it as a forward for a children's book that I've been working on for a long time, just to sort of set the stage. Um, so the title is Every Child. And so this poem is for every child, young or old, every child. Every child needs someone who loves nature who understands the wonder and connection of all living things, who walks slowly in a meadow or garden, someone to name the plants and birds, someone who will simply say, aren't the flowers beautiful? I want to thank you for listening to me read my poem today. It's been a great pleasure. It's a great pleasure writing them. and. Uh, I recommend it to uh, anybody who wants to begin. And uh, so that's it for me. Have a wonderful summer and a wonderful winter show. And when it shows up, but enjoy the spring in the meantime and uh, see you at Coffee Call. Okay. Thank you. Are you walked in the room and there's a feather on my feet What a lucky day, what a lucky, lucky Your heart blew right through me and mine beat and beat What a lucky day, what a lucky, lucky day I waited so long, I shivered all alone Dark and icy places I hope you never know Waiting to come home Just to be known And now you're here And there's nothing left to know Now you are beside me Almost every single day And each one is a lucky day it's a lucky, lucky day All couples touch hands And remember how it feels to be In a lucky way On a lucky, lucky day I waited so long I shivered all alone In dark and icy places I hope you never know Waiting to come home Just to be known you're here and there's nothing left to go
saw a tiny light It came toward it so that night You wrapped around me like a warm coat in a cold And I say, what a lucky day What a lucky, lucky day There's a quote that's been attributed to the ancient Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu, and it goes like this. Watch your thoughts, they become your words. Watch your words, they become your actions. Watch your actions, they become your habits. Watch your habits, they become your character. Watch your character, it becomes your destiny. Now, I first heard that quote in a yoga class, and I really liked it. And I tried to remember it at the end of a marathon when I was feeling tired and needed to encourage myself. But the problem is when you're at the end of a marathon, your body's tired and your mind is tired. And all I could conjure up was watch your, watch your, watch your step. <laughs> that wasn't it. As we saw over the past four years, more than ever, words can be used to motivate or deflate, incite or invite, harm or heal. As Lao Tzu points out, words are powerful and language is behavior. What you say and think and write shapes your world and your life. Use your words, we tell small children, especially when they're acting out of frustration. Use your words. Choose your words wisely. I'm an editor by day and sometimes a writer, and I spend a lot of time thinking about word choice. Is this the right word to say what you mean? The Irish poet Padre Otuma says that we infuse words with a sense of who we are. So, th so therefore, he says, you're not just saying a word, you're communicating something that feels like your soul. Now, if I were a trained theologian, I might talk about the word of God. But don't worry, I'm not, I'm not even a poet. So I'm here today to celebrate National Poetry Month. I do believe in choosing words with deliberation and care, mindful not just of intent, but of impact. I say I'm not a poet, and you might think the same thing, but whether we recognize it or not, whether we write them or read them or hear them, all of us are touched by the words flying all around us. Which words will you welcome into your mind to shape thoughts, character, destiny? Naomi Shihab Nye, the Young People's Poet Laureate, is also a teacher. And when she goes into a new classroom, she writes on the chalkboard, you are living in a poem. And her students ask her, well, what does that mean? we're living in a poem. Like, is it all the time or just when we're talking about poetry? And here's what she says she means. When you think, when you're in a very quiet place, 
when you're remembering, when you're savoring an image, when you're allowing your mind to calmly leap from one thought to another. That's a poem. That's what a poem does. Isn't that a wonderful idea? We're living in a poem. It's up to us to take heed and notice. In a poem called The Meadow, Marie Howe writes about the earth and the beings who tread upon the earth in a perpetual cycle of sleep and waking, work and discovery. She writes, Bedeviled human, your plight in waking is to choose from the words that even now sleep on your tongue and to know that tangled among them and terribly new is the sentence that could change your life. Watch your words. They become actions, habit, character, destiny. What words will you choose for healing and for growth? Hello. For those of you who don't know me well, my name is Nina Marquard, and I'm a junior at Bernard's High School. I'm a transracial adoptee and Chinese American. And right now, I want to talk about the racism, xenophobia, and hate crimes against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. White people especially need to listen because this is the discussion long overdue. On March 16th, a white man shot and killed eight people in Georgia. Six of these people were Asian women. This is absolutely unacceptable. This is a hate crime stemming from yellow fever and the violent fetishization and objectification of Asian women. It is also an act of terror driven by xenophobia. Since March of 2020, thousands of hate crimes have been reported against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. COVID-19 has become people's excuse to be racist and xenophobic. Calling it Kung Flu or the China virus is racist. Blaming the virus on all Asian Americans is racist. Saying that all Asians eat bats is racist. So let's talk about racism and xenophobia. This country has a long history of being xenophobic towards Asians. Look at the Chinese Exclusion Act and Japanese internment camps, just to name a few. And today, most of my Asian American friends were born right here in the United States, just the same as their white peers but face racism and xenophobia because they aren't white. If you are not Asian, have you ever pushed the narrative of all Asians are smart or all Asians are good at math? Well, that's rooted in a racist stereotype. White people created the myth of something called the model minority. Using Asians as examples of successful minorities in this country to fit their own agenda. This pitted minorities against each other and ensured that white people would remain in a place of privilege and power. Now, I want to make it clear to the many white people who have this mindset. Asian Americans are not a monolith. I certainly don't represent all Asian experiences. Asia is more than just East Asia. And I don't represent all Chinese American experiences. I am here to tell my experience. And for me right now, being an Asian American woman is exhausting, heartbreaking, and scary. But even more so, I'm angry. Angry at the racism and xenophobia in this country that drives people to violence against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. But I'm also angry with people's responses, or lack thereof. I'm glad that I see a few white people acknowledging what's happening to Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. However, posting on your Instagram story is only as effective as you make it. It's not enough to press a button. You have to realize that these hate crimes come from deeply rooted racism and xenophobia towards Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. Amplify Asian American and Pacific Islander voices in a respectful and sensitive manner. Educate yourself and check in on your Asian American and Pacific Islander friends and family, but do not stay silent. No one is asking you to be a political activist, but you must be actively anti-racist. Now I'm going to directly address my community. Growing up in Bernardsville as a Chinese American and going to a predominantly white institution is something that few of my peers can relate to. I never saw someone who represented me in the books we read for English. I've had people pull the corners of their eyes back and tell me that I'm supposed to be smart. 
And what white people in Bernardsville will never understand is the constant awareness I feel every time I enter a room and notice it's a majority of white people. Or when I bring up racism and everyone enters an uncomfortable silence. Except the silence speaks volumes. This is a community that struggles to talk about racism in the present day and to face the fact that many people here who perpetuate racism when they fail to adequately educate themselves. We in Burnsville live in a bubble and that has become an excuse for letting racism slide and allowing white privilege to go unacknowledged. I acknowledge that I have privilege and that I ben benefit from other people's white privilege since both of my parents are white. However, this community needs to do better. White supremacy is very real. Racism is very real. Xenophobia is very real. Sinophobia is very real. Just because it's not happening to you doesn't mean it's not happening. We need to have these conversations and they might make you uncomfortable. But remember that while you might feel uncomfortable talking about racism, Asian Americans and other people of color continue to violently suffer in this country because of it. The price of living and growing up in this country shouldn't be racism. To everyone, I hope that you take this to heart and actively work to be anti-racist. And if anyone has any questions or wants to talk more about this, let me know. I am comfortable talking, but not everyone is. Reminder that it's not the job of a person of color to educate white people. And to my fellow Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, I hope you and your families are safe and please reach out if you need someone to talk to. Again, Amplify Asian American voices, also support local Asian American owned businesses, educate yourself and check in on your Asian American and Pacific Islander friends and family. Thank you for listening. We started out so small, we were hardly there at all. We are the river flowing on, flowing on. And in just a little while, we have covered many a mile. We are the river flowing on. We are the river. If you like our music, you can join our song. We are the river. Come along, come along, come along. Rushing down the mountainside with the future open wide. We are the river flowing on, flowing on. Flowing onward through the night, flowing on into the light. We are the river flowing on. We are the river. If you like our music, you can join our song. We are the river. Come along, come along, come along. Streams from a hundred human dreams. We are the river flowing on, flowing on. From unnumbered hills we come, yet our journey makes us one. We are the river flowing on. We are the river. If you like our music, you can join our song. We are the river. Come along, come along, come along. Down the valley, through the plain, we flow on, yet we remain. We are the river flowing on, flowing on, singing joyful, singing free, singing onward to the sea. We are the river flowing on. We are the river. If you like our music, you can join our song. We are the river. Come along, come along, come along. Come along, come along, come along.
And now for our closing words, a poem by Zeta Elliot, and it's called Blessing. May you have a resilient spirit and a compassionate heart, the desire to heal and the will to forgive. May you never exhaust your capacity for kindness. May you always find peace in your home and in your mind. May your eyes be awake to the beauty all around you. May your ears be tuned to the varied songs of life. May your arms always be ready to embrace those needing comfort. And may even the simplest blessings fill your heart with gratitude. Blessed be, and may it be so, and go in peace.